It is so fucking good. Isn't that like a, but it's not on the menu. You have to like. Yeah, you have to know. It's like, yeah. And it's you're not like allowed to call it like me- yeah, medicine ball so. anymore because you can't say medicine. What? I don't fucking know. I don't know. know. Start I the refuse, show. I refuse to speak your language. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't do <laughs> You're like, you know what Tell I mean. Me I won't do the thing. Robbie, I spilled. You spilled? Yes. What did you spill? My drink. You only have you have two it's, drinks. I only need one paper towel. A bounty though. It has to be a bounty quicker. I've seen the upper. I've seen the commercials. They do a pretty good job. <laughs> well, well, welcome to Love and Then What? Love and Then What? With your host. Welcome, lovers and friends. It's me, your boy, Mr. Everybody. And this episode was brought to you by Erotic Boudoir. Erotic Boudoir are professionals in the adult industry with expertise in sensual pleasure. Allow them to guide you and your partners to a world of ecstasy with their products, events, techniques, cater to your desires. Prioritize your pleasure with Erotic Boudoir. Go to E-R-O-T-I-C-B-O-U-D-O-I-R.com or touchingmindbodyandsoul.com. And I am joined by my co-host, Mar. <laughs> <laughs> and we are joined by a super special guest, somebody I've grown up watching my, most of my life, almost my whole life, a skateboarder, jackass, author, motivational speaker, inter- and interventionist, Brandon Novak. How you doing, sir? What up, man? What up? Dude, what holy... Up, what up? Well, now, you know, <laughs> it, it's all just kind of become very clear to me why every time I catch pieces of this so it's about, like, sex with the whole sponsorship package. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. We're, we're well, pretty new to... The sponsorship actually came second. No, Justin is just... Likes to talk about sex on the internet, rightfully so. But <laughs> I mean, it's a good, it's a good but topic. Now it works. Yeah. Now we have a, a it's like the sponsorship it's all and lines. the genre. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty good topic, and I actually have somebody that wanted to welcome you to the show. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> oh no! What's on the other screen? Well, I had to keep getting. Yeah. Brandon Novak. Ah. What's up? What's up? How you doing, my man? Welcome to the Love and Then What podcast. It's your boy Donnie Barley out here in Rhode Island. Um, this guy Justin just hit me up, told me, me you were coming on the pod. <laughs> so just here to welcome you here and say, man, so grateful for your friendship. I'm so proud of all the work you're doing. So encouraged by all the work you're doing in recovery. Um, and uh, the house that you opened up, man, I got to get my butt down there and check that out. And um yeah, man. Love you, bro. Hope you have a good time on the podcast. Hope we get to skate again soon. And I'll make my way down to Baltimore at some point. Um, much love, my man. One day at a time. You. Yeah, it's my guy, <laughs> man. I love him to death. I've known him for years and years and years. Yeah, he was a super nice guy. I, I found him like through a tagged picture, and when I reached out to him, he was so like open to talk, and yeah. he just had the nicest things to say about you. I was like, would you mind? like? Send me a video, maybe just trying to get like you know behind the scenes who no, you really no, are. That was really kind of you. He's um we you know we had spent a lot of years skating together, partying together, and then briefly kind of like butted heads. And and I didn't even really think much about it until he had gotten sober prior to me. And later on down the road, like in this twelve step program of ours, we work these steps, and and one of those steps is making amends, like mm-hmm. wronging our rights that we may have done to somebody intentionally or unintentionally. unintentionally and and he did that and i didn't even know that it like i didn't even know that he was like bummed at me or you know so it was really cool it's it was a big deal did you reach back out to him on your steps or yeah 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 that's yeah, awesome yeah 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 so kind of came, works came full circle so we're actually not far from where you filmed a lot growing up viva la bam all those things so did you get any deja vu coming up here i did i did um i you know the uh, it's, 322 and 202 meet and there's like this CVS there and years ago we were filming a jackass and I, I woke up what actually it was weird because it was coming think about it is it was two jackasses so the one jackass we were filming I woke up and I was I was sick and I, I didn't feel good and, and I was kind of detoxing and, and I, I had this leather jacket on at the time it had all these zippers and, and pockets and I went in one and it was a, a friend of mine or an associate of some sort stole a prescription pad from a dentist in Baltimore. And he wrote a script out and he gave it to me. I didn't think much about it. It was my pocket. So I wake up this morning. I'm kind of ill and I'm like, fuck it. I'll just take it to a pharmacy. And, right. and I end up here because Bam's house isn't too far from here. Mm-hmm. And, and I just drove there and, and I'm in the pharmacy and I, I pass the script and 
And I give it to the lady, and I'm thinking that she's coming back with it shortly. And and shortly she comes out on the phone, and she says, um, I hear her talking, and she said, he's he's driving a black Mercedes, and, and he's got a black leather jacket on with a black fedora. And at that point, like... You were a big fedora, <laughs> you were a big fedora guy. It made You're sense. like, oh, <laughs> yeah, this is not things good. Things became pretty clear what was going down, so I left. Never thought anything about it again, right? Like, no harm, no foul. Literally just slid a piece of paper to a woman. That was it. Fast forward a year later, we're filming The Next Jackass. I break both my ankles and, and, and all my ribs at the same time and get a concussion. And I'm in the ambulance, and they're taking me to the hospital. And, and there's an, uh, a state trooper following the ambulance. And they're like, yo, there's a state trooper. And I said, yeah, it's probably just, you know, to get us there a little quicker. And when I get in there, two broken ankles, all broken ribs, a concussion, the officer walks up. He said, are you Mr. Novak? I said, yes. He says, we've been looking for you for two years now. And fucking pulls out a list, <laughs> one of which being a felony, which um, today, because of that, I'm a, I'm a convicted felon. Yeah. <laughs> and I spent a year in George W. Hill, which was quite an experience. Um, yeah. So that was the first one I got coming here. Okay. And so does this bring up like, does this bring up like any urges besides going to prison? Like. You know, you grew up here. You obviously... I love that shit. It's very nostalgic to me. You mm -hmm. know, I love kind of... Because I'm so busy in the day-to-day, -day and I have a lot of different things going on, a million moving parts, that I, it, it's rare that I reflect back on, like, where I was to where I am. But Westchester especially is some of the places I have some of the best memories of my life. And a, and a lot of those took place under the influence of drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would not do those over it. And I, or anything, but I don't make it back much. Right. You know what I mean? It's, it's not my home. It's it had been my home for like fourteen years. Yeah, you know, and, and the way that I transitioned here was homeless heroin addict in Baltimore City, and Bam and I were best friends growing up, skateboarding together, and and every year there was this contest in in Bricktown, New Jersey, called the NSA's National Skateboarding Association, and and every year without fail, either he would win or I would win. And one year, he was there with another guy, Bucky Lasik from Baltimore, who got me sponsored by Pal. They show up, and, and Bam says to Bucky, yo, where's Novak? And, and Bucky said, well, he's on heroin. And Bam was like, what's that? You know, he was so young, he yeah. couldn't comprehend. Right. So needless to say, his career completely, like, excels. My right. digresses. He creates CKY, which turns into Viva La Bam, fucking... Jackass, millions and millions, household names, right guard commercial, Wheaties, fucking, box, you know, literally. <laughs> right guard. Um, and, and, um, and mine, my resume reads like a homeless fucking junkie living in Baltimore, letting men blow me for heroin. <laughs> like, like somehow I picked the wrong <laughs> right, career path. Right. And I'm not sure. We've I all been there though. Like, I mean, this is my fault. Like, <laughs> like why? How here? Like, fuck. But before, or no, like, so one day, Bam ended up in Baltimore one day doing a demo at this skate shop. In this skate shop, I would occasionally visit and, and hit up money from them. And, and this day I went, which happened to be the day after he was there. And I walked in. I'm like, yeah, can I get a couple bucks? Like, we're not going to give you money. But Bam was here yesterday. He left you his phone number. And, and he said, if you wanted to get off heroin and, and, and start to skateboard again and get your career back, call him. Week later, I call him and, and, and get through to him, and, and he's like, yo, are you done? And, and I was, in my mind, I, I believe that I was. Little did I know I was, like, far from done with addiction. And, uh, but he, he, that night, he had me on a Greyhound bus coming from Baltimore to Westchester, and, mm -hmm. and I had never left from that. Well, I'd leave, but, like, he'd kick me out. And then I'd go back and realize how fucking hell my life was. Yeah. So the scales, so ending up, so, so ending up in Jackass was, people were like, dude, was that, like, gnarly? Did you, don't you, like, regret getting hurt and being the <laughs> fucking punching bag? And I'm like, let's weigh the scales of justice You're like, here. you, I was punching myself anyway. Well, I'm in a, a way. I'm a homeless heroin addict <laughs> yeah, who like, literally let punchy. men suck my dick for money. And I, and I don't even go that way. And it's not even, a, it's just my deal. I think it's whatever it is. <laughs> it's just my dick. So, He's using like, his resources. Yeah, like, I <laughs> did not want to be eating out of a trash can, sleeping in an abandoned house while prostituting my body during the day to come up with 10 bucks. So I could do that, or I could fucking break every 
rib and, yeah. and a concussion going down a rolling naked on a pair of fucking rollerblades. Wait, and make 20 friends. bucks. And make a lot of money, <laughs> be on a fucking TV, become a, you know. And yeah. It's, so the scales of justice were really easy to lay out. <laughs> so how long have you been sober for now? Uh, May will be eight years. That's awesome. Congratulations. My girlfriend just hit 90 days. Fuck Ooh, yeah. Dude, 90 days I love is that. serious business, man. It takes much longer to get 90 days than it will take to get 90 months. You know what I mean? Early on, it's like you're kind of fucking looking at the clock and like, what's happening? So, yeah. was there well, I think it also it like a lot depends on how you identify yourself too. Like, if you're just like, that's not what I do now. You know what I mean? Like, if you look at it, you can like use your days, or you can like lose your days, kind of. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. you're gaining really all of this extra life when you're getting rid of those things that are putting you in places or situations that aren't doing anything for you and then when you're like realizing you're like oh wow this is better here no doubt and that's what i mean by like it takes longer to get 90 days than 90 months because the the longer you stay sober what happens yeah, the more is you say get this beautiful fucking life yeah. that we now believe is worth living for and not worth getting loaded over but we have to stay long enough to yeah to be blessed with that really rad life right so at 90 days, it's like, well, you know, not much has really is fucking it? changed. Yeah. <laughs> is it 90 days to me, to your boyfriend, I'm sure, I'm sure he can really attest to how fucking major that is. But like to your old. mom, she's like, that's a blink of an eye. <laughs> you know? it's, it's definitely different living with somebody when, you know, they're going through that. But it's, she's been amazing. She's she's also recently lost 20 pounds. She's quit vaping. She's done a lot of things where the I'm really proud of her. vaping is huge, too. That's it's fucking, during that's, this. That's a prime Bro. alcoholic right there. Yeah. Let's she's, not just quit drugs and alcohol. We're going to fucking lose weight. We're going to quit vaping. We're going to get a facelift. You know, all at once. Oh, she's she's done all these Turn things. Yeah, <laughs> get it, girl. I, I'm a fan. So is there a day where you realize you would stay sober? Or was there, like, a feeling that you made knowing that it would be, like, the last? time dude like it was funny had. i remember fucking filming like the viva la bams and all that stuff at bam's house and and we would literally f- finish filming for the day the cast and the crew and we'd go into town right to westchester and we'd all meet up at the pub and just get fucking loaded but i would always go to a meeting before i met them in town and bam's like why what the fuck do you like why it, do you go <laughs> to a, a 12-step meeting to then meet us at the town at the pub to just get completely annihilated sniff blow for the, you know whatever and, and he's like that makes no sense but to me i knew that like one my my issue was much deeper and and and, and more fucking darker than some of those thank god um because i wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy but i knew within that like it was going to end one of two ways with me like either i was going to get sober or i would die trying mm-hmm. like i was not the dude that was just Totally content with fucking sniffing blow and shooting dope for the rest of my life. Right. That wasn't acceptable to me. But you kept doing it anyway. Yes. Because I, 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 wasn't, uh, I wasn't armed with the facts. I, I did not have a proper understanding of what I was up against. As a matter of fact, I completely underestimated the opponent that I was fighting every fucking day. It's surprising because you seem like a really smart guy. Well, that was your the mother's. I was too right. smart. Self-aware. Mother and your brother like, are really smart. Straight up. Yep. I, w- I would like, I would, I would fucking end up in a, a chair in a, in a treatment center or a 12-step meeting that was ultimately going to save my life and I would outthink myself out of this fucking seat every time because I was too smart for my own good. So, yeah, you went to 13 rehabs, correct? Yeah. Did you go to them thinking you would get out clean, get clean every time? No. Or did you just go there to get people off your back? It just depends on which one you're talking about. <laughs> right, like different <laughs> motives. Real. Every time you're like, I'm going to go here for a reason. Well, like maybe the it was- first five was just to prove a point that it was all an overreaction at best. Mm-hmm. And you just simply caught me at a bad time on a, on a bad way in a bad day. Right. And tomorrow was going to be different. And I mm. meant and believe that. Uh, unfortunately, I'd wake up tomorrow to repeat yesterday's actions. And I was stuck in Groundhog's Day for 22 fucking years. Mm-hmm. Um, so then like one through six was that just to fucking prove a point to mm-hmm. you nut jobs that like I could drink successfully and, and shoot dope like a gentleman. And, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and around treatment center number eight to eight to, to nine, 10 was like, okay, this is a little eye opening. And maybe that there might be like, I remember right here's a prime example. I remember I went to this treatment center. This is around number nine and I had uh, a fiance and, um, and, uh, I loved her and she was a great woman, is a great woman. And, and I, I, I went to treatment and I called her and, and, and she's like, yeah, so when you come home, you can just like drink wine. And that's what I, I loved wine. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that's all I drank was wine. 
And normally that's what I would do every time. But like a fucking moron, I told to her, I was like, yeah, but I'm different because at the bottom of my wine glass is a needle every time. So I can't drink. Right. Because I bought into it at that moment in treatment center number eight. I started to believe I had a problem. But then when I got out, I was so fucking furious because I, I told on myself. Right. And I couldn't drink. And, right. And I was right. so angry. So ultimately, I drank. So that was at like number eight. Like I started to kind of realize that there was an issue, but not quite fully. And, Number 13, I was willing to suck every dick in the world to get one more shot at one more bed at one more facility, right? Like the pain had become so great, I was willing to do anything. So what what made you quit? Did you just run out of dicks to suck or what happened? Um, I, fuck, probably. <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 my price was not nearly what it started out in the beginning. Like showers were less, changes of clothes were less. I was not like high, high fucking market there. Um, no, what happened was it... At, at treatment center number 13, 38 years old, right? Like, uh, literally, the only thing that I owned in this world at 38 was was eight scarves, two jackets, three socks, a stick of deodorant that all fit into this bag that doubles my pillow, a needle, a spoon, and a restraining order. I had been in 12 inpatient treatment centers. Um, my mother had bought me a plot. People had taken life insurance policies out on me. May 23rd, 2015, two days before I went into my God willing last facility, I, I found myself coming to on life support at, at Mercy Hospital in Baltimore City, um, having been, uh, you know, for lack of better words, dead for seven days. And, you know, th at that point, there was no way it was completely impossible for me to undermine or uh, undermine or justify the severity of my alcoholism. Right. Like the writing was on my wall in my writing. I, I couldn't say, well, if, if the fucking fiance now ex didn't come home early and find the needle on the counter, if if the parole officer wasn't fucking pissed at me and, and didn't piss me, um, if the judge's wife would have fucked him, maybe he would have been in a better <laughs> mood before he sentenced me. You know, what I mean, like yeah. all I was doing was just rearranging the furniture on the Titanic for years and my ship would continuously sink every time. And at 38 years old, I, I couldn't even like lie to myself mm -hmm. it, it was completely apparent uh, that my way no longer worked and my very best thinking placed me here and and the you know unmanageability for a fellow like me is a monday morning right like that's just fucking par for the course but may 25th the pain became so unbearable that that real the, the reality was i could no longer inject enough heroin and cocaine in my arm that would allow me to escape the reality that i had created for myself See, because prior to that date, I could fucking cook up a speedball, bang it up. And, and and now not only was like homeless addict who prostitutes during the day, like, you know, uh, doable. It was like desirable, right? Mm -hmm. Like it would play these, it would create these delusional narratives in my mind that weren't even real. So that was cool. But then what happens when the drugs no longer work, mm -hmm. right? So I'm having this moment of clarity when I'm sober and when I'm high and I'm not fucking accepting of my outcome anymore. And, and, and what was even worse is that I knew that I had created it. Right. I was going to say it's accountability. Completely self-induced. Yeah. And Once was, you, cause when you catch yourself like thinking, Oh, the judge's wife or, um, you know, the lady who cut me off on the street, like all of these little things, it's like, it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. It sounds comes like, down to you. Sounds like, just like my brother. Like he, he is completely addicted, like gambling. And I'm sure there's other things I, I really don't talk to him that much, but yeah, he'll always blame somebody else. He'll crash a car once every three or four it's months, I and mean, then he'll blame somebody well, else. The, the guy, if you have guy to be like, I'm me. fucked up because of me. Hello, that no, is, yeah, <laughs> no, mean, thank you. That I don't is like the that. Last thing that I want to do is realize no one wants to. I, and that, and again, at, at 13, treatment center number 13, it was it was so apparent to me because I'd attempted to find sobriety so many times, sometimes like of my own volition and other times not. Mm -hmm. But looking back, not one of those fucking attempts were failures. Whether mm -hmm. I got high in there. You had to. Whether I left. Because these seeds were being planted. Exactly. Unbeknownst to me. Yes. I, I had no idea that they were yes. taking place. And, and what I know today is life is live forward and learn backwards. So all of a sudden, the pain becomes great enough. May 25th, 2015. For the first time in my life, I'm finally willing to do whatever it takes. I, I, I pick this thing up and I call somebody that clearly knows much better than I do because like they've been sober for years. And, and I asked them for help. And when they suggested what I do, I fucking followed through. And, and these were unlike my behavioral patterns prior to this date. Mm -hmm. 
Then I end up in treatment and I realize that fucking my problem has nothing to do with heroin, cocaine, wine, Xanax. It's actually the exact opposite. It's the solution to my problem. And although drugs kind of bridge that gap to allow me to end up in a place to look at me for exactly who I was, then at that point with the proper like guidance and instructions, I was able to address the real issue at hand, which is my thinking, my attitude, and my behavior. Right? The behavioral patterns. Bro, I'm, like, I'm I love it. I, I, I love just want to say this. I'm so proud to be a fan of you because been a fan. I grew up, obviously. I fucking apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up watching you. Um, me and my girl, so we started hanging out. One of the first things we did was we watched CKY. And growing up, like, you know, as a kid, I was like, this is one of my favorite movies of all time. And then we were, wound up having sex to it. And we probably had wow. sex with you oh in the background. God, I'm so happy so for you you've guys probably been in the room one. where we were having sex. That'd so no, rad, not many man. people have. Yeah, Let so. me just put that out there because you, my dad, he, and my he dog like listening to other men's <laughs> voices while he's fucking. By the way, classic classical music. We we've been doing it a lot lately, and classical music. You guys are fucking sorely mistaken. <laughs> have sex to classical music if you don't do it. But there's also oh, something to be said about God. fucking in a room with your dog, because that's that's kind of like a, a, a voyeuristic kind well, of Well, he doesn't thing. join in. I mean, when he was a puppy, he had to be like in the foot of the bed. He's he's normally down, so I'm a cat guy. I'm, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm a noticed. single man, a forty four year old single man that lives with three cats, so that kind of states how great I am with relationships. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> What I, 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 I have, you know, whatever I do, whenever I do it, like, though sometimes they may have a dog and the dog is just like, it's fucking weird. And the dog will stare and then they put the dog out of the room and then the dog cries. Like, mauling the door down as if their mother is like being murdered or. What are you doing to, to the mother? Yeah, no, well, no. You're not that good. Are you that good? No. I'd like to believe. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm that good. One million percent. I never thought of the dog as voyeurism. Your, is your dog in your bed while you're with a guy? I know he's there when you're by yourself. Yeah, he's definitely there when I'm by myself. I but never I also, you have a like, guy. voyeurism you, is, is kind of a thing for me, though, too, I think. Like you watching or you that like somebody watching? That's reality for him, I'd imagine. Well, she likes no, watching no, herself. No. You like no. watching yourself. Yeah, well, if I'm going to come to porn, I don't feel like watching it be someone getting railed out for, like, hours at a time. I don't know what her conditions are and how she's feeling. How long are you taking a jerk off? <laughs> hours? Yes, she wasn't about the conditions no, of I'm the sorry. candidates. You're not going to fucking marry these women. Relax, girl. No, I'm just like, Jeez. I just know that my, like, my videos, I was, like, feeling good, like, da-da-da-da. So, like, I'm like, okay, this is all good. Like, it's, like, clean porn to me. Yourself. Okay. Does that make sense? It's just recycling yourself. Why anyone yeah. would want clean porn is beyond well, me. Well, clean, That's like energetically, totally I'm saying, energetically. What kind of porn okay. are you into, Noah? <laughs> uh, I, you know what? True story. I've, I've given up porn. See, really? that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. That's is what it because I'm saying. It's kind of like a transfer addiction. Well, I, no, because I'm not a sex addict. It's just like desensitizing. Yes, so that's exactly what it was. Yeah, right? like, so that's why I do it to myself. <laughs> I was at a point where like I would have to come whether like a, a, once a day i'm not like a five time a day kind of guy once a day is like enough for me but it got to a point where i was desensitized to the physical act yeah right it was just more of like a thing and then i'm like dude i just want and i just stopped jerking off so that when the physical act takes place it actually is a bit more euphoric to me mm -hmm. than yeah. just like a, a thing Okay. And we uh, talked yeah. about that recently because I. But found I will watch porn with a woman, and yeah. that's cool. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But not alone to jerk off. Yeah, it can get. It's there's blurred lines there. What about when you're in the shower? You don't jerk off in the shower. Not you. I would never want to jerk off in the shower. Why? That's just standing. Like, you got it's, soap, you got water, you know, yeah, splish, splash, <laughs> taking a bath. I don't want to. That's just soap and water. It's weird. It, like it, I wouldn't want to fuck in the shower either. Fucking in the shower is like it's just a weird concept it depends what kind of shower you got if you got a stand-up shower i understand if there's a bathtub situation you fall you break your neck but but what it doesn't really lube anything up. yeah i it's get just, that yeah you kind of gotta like you gotta put the water it can the side, actually sometimes go the opposite yeah. way yeah, yeah. It can. it's kind of like fucking in a hot tub that's retarded that's a, that's a bad word i don't know if she's that <laughs> the bad word in that was retarded nothing else i said <laughs> um yeah and fucking on a beach is you know dumb too we yeah. fucked in the ocean we fucked in the pool the pool's the hardest one actually because she kept floating away so you have to keep pulling her back <laughs> <laughs> uh, i feel like those are just the things you do to say you did them you know you're like yeah, oh. that, yeah. it was definitely a story situation <laughs> like, oh well we were in like punta cana and you know da, da, da. we were in jamaica so we were like you know checking things off the the yeah, list of like we gotta have, have sex a... there 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 <laughs> that makes sense i get it <laughs> i get it so are you somebody who knew, needs like treats if you do something good 
meaning like you need to reward yourself every time you do something. Because I've noticed a lot of addicts in my current uh, <laughs> I thought relationship. we were still on the sexual topic. I'm like, I, okay, this I mean, do you need a, a different I'm twist? like, me, yes. She's all about, she's fucking I'm like, salivating cake, over here. like, yes. <laughs> she's like, sat up, legs <laughs> open. Let's treat. Who has she a treat? Always, she always has her legs open here. <laughs> it's literally not true. What's, what, what's going on with your legs right now? I'm, I'm. You're manspreading right now for everyone that's I'm listening. I'm not manspreading. People that are listening at home. Don't make me manspread because I could, <laughs> but I don't want to. I have enough DMs that go unanswered, you know? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was going to say, you need, you need to read some of those DMs. Do you have a lot of DMs from girls? How cheap. Not, not like I did because I, I have kind of a different wheelhouse these days. I don't really, my, my social media yeah, platforms but, don't really promote sexual activities. Yeah. You know. You should get a, occasionally here and there. I will. You should like a Novak sex Instagram. No, that's like. not a good look for me. I'm, I'm, I'm like <laughs> right. the healthcare Off world. Brand. Off brand. Like helping people. You know, it's funny because prior to my, so I help people get help, right? Mm -hmm. And and people will call me and 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 I've had like a, a 22 year old kid from Chicago call me, right? And and this 22 year old kid has been an addict for years, and mom's been begging him to go to treatment for years, and he's just not about it. He comes across my deal cause the number attached to it all of a sudden I answer and and I am able to do for 22 year old Bobby in one hour what mom has not been able to do in years right get him to to agree commit and actually follow through with with going to get on a plane in about a five hour span and flying to a different state to go to treatment yeah. all of a sudden mom comes home and asks Bob Bobby's packed his bags right at the door there's a car coming what are you doing well I'm going to treatment I've been trying to get you to go for years. Why yeah. now? Why today? Well, well, there's this guy, Brandon Novak. Mom has no clue of me, right? And then she'll Google me and pull me up, and 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 literally two things will appear: either you know uh, the second coming to Jesus Christ or Satan spawned. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And and I've literally had mom say, "There's no way you will." be getting on a plane and going any you will end up in like a sex trafficking ring or like legit and, and rightfully so but like, like you go back duality like you can't have light without darkness so it's like you well, just had your darkness early you need to have all light or all dark right <laughs> but no but i'm saying he's like proof of proof of possibility like for someone well you know the 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 felony that i picked up right up the street here mm -hmm. in Anywhere else in the world, that would be a terrible look for the work world. Right. Only in my world does it add depth and weight and credibility. Well, credibility. it's like it works if you Ex work it. Yeah. It like that worked for you. It didn't at the well, time. It works in your story now because exactly. it's like, look what you've done, yes. you know? But people love trying to create your future based off of your past. Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, he did this, this, and this. Okay, well, what is he doing now, and what is his? What is he planning to do tomorrow? Well, you know what I mean. In hindsight, that makes complete sense to you or I, but tell that to Bobby's mom. Right, like, right. Fuck no. No, yeah, yeah, and then I get Bobby it. Bobby doesn't get on the plane. It's a sin. Yeah. So it's it, you know I come from people a world just judge. prior to sobriety where any press was good press, and I meant that mm -hmm. by all means. And then I get in here, and it's like, no, that's not really the case. Right. So, it's but just, it's like you're working with the card you've been dealt. Like you can't change the yeah. shit from the past. It just is what it is. Well, that's why we can't like create this new future of me opening up a DM line for oh, sex. Oh, a thousand percent. Things. No, <laughs> well, I, I could see suggested. like <laughs> I could see women hitting you up and being like cuz I feel like you could get, you know, relationships which then in some way usually lead to sex. Not all relationships obviously, but some relationships, but it's like, you know, if you meet like-minded people and you guys are able to connect on different things, like I could see people DMing you or girls DMing you and being like, "Hey, I like this or I like that." That the oh, way it you goes look down. at this, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not like what it right used to, to the, be. Where yeah, it's like, like where it's like, "Hey, you want to meet right now?" Like deals. <laughs> deals. Yeah. So what do you think the difference between Bobby's brain, an addict's brain, and somebody who's not an addict is? What is the difference there? Who? Bo oh, oh, Bobby's you're, you're brain. Bobby. Yeah, Bobby. Bobby's brain, and say, "I'm not an addict." My brain. Yeah. What's the difference between? Well, the them? disconnection from reality and your reality and Bobby's reality are two fucking completely different realities. Mm -hmm. Like you know, the, the abnormal becomes the normal when you're Bobby, and, mm -hmm. and the day to day is 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 finding ways and means to get more by any and all means necessary. You know, as opposed to you. Where you're like, don't you understand that this is not a healthy decision to make for your future, Bobby? 
And Bobby's like, fuck off. Give me $10. I'm going to fucking kill you. <laughs> I, will, I will let you suck my dick for $10. Like, legit. And, and, and Bobby will have a fucking knife to your throat and saying, if you don't give me this money, like, I will slit your throat before or after I suck your dick, whether you're going to, you know. <laughs> but it's I can be even, dead. You can and, suck my dick. And it's not even personal. It's business. Because right. mm-hmm. Bobby does not want to do what Bobby's doing. Mm-hmm. Right? But the abnormal becomes the normal. And then we become physically and mentally uh, addicted to a substance that where our body... It, will do anything in its capability to not have to go through withdrawal. Are you inferring that it's nature rather than nurture or? Uh, it's just business. <laughs> also our <laughs> Slow jobs are just business. It, 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 there was, I am not cut from that cloth. I'm a straight man. I have, uh, but <laughs> there's nothing in me that had any desire to want to stand on the corner of Eastern Avenue and Patterson Park, which is a, a, an area in Baltimore City where a lot of younger guys stand to let men pick them up and, and orally please them. And, and there was, I used to, as a matter of fact, you know, when I was really young and naive and ignorant to a lot of things like a young skater kid in Baltimore, we'd skate past and we'd talk shit to those guys and we'd make fun of them. And, and as it plays out, I became them and nothing in me. As a matter of fact, if you read Dream Seller, which is my first book, the book opens up with that because mm-hmm. that was something that I swore that I would never, ever, ever, ever do. Yeah, that's like movie-esque for Legit. sure. Legit. Yeah. And it starts out with my last day using, which was what created that pain and willingness to do whatever it took to get out of that position. But nonetheless, I, I committed that act um, again because like it was just business Mm -hmm. well and our body is like meant to keep us safe so like his safe space wasn't safe per se to a normal person but like him using since he had done it so often like that was your safe yeah that was my normal yeah that was your safe so where you would be very that's a very abnormal thing to mm -hmm. do so he's like okay your body like is gonna you know put you in positions to keep Mm -hmm. that like going because that survival yeah exactly Crazy. That's the deal. The name of the game is Plead the Fifth. Oh, God. The name of the game is Plead the Fifth. What's going to happen is I'm going to ask you five questions during this game. You can plead the fifth once and only once. But if you do, you have to make a social media post directed by me. Me telling you what to say. <laughs> Sounds like a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all in, so, but that's... Question yeah. one. Yeah. What is the craziest tattoo you have? Um, well, I don't... Crazy to me is, like, really crazy. So, But the one that sparks the most interest... Here, we'll do this. Who can guess what this is? Is that a state? So you say state. <laughs> Not a state. Country, maybe? Is this a penis? Rocket. Where? Right that's, that's not even part of the fucking tattoo. Oh. I pointed to this. She, she thinks she sees a cock somewhere else, and she's like, oh. <laughs> this. I don't know what that is. Okay. <laughs> We were awake for probably like five days doing large amounts of cocaine. Who's we? Bam, myself, and a handful of other people at his house up the street. Mm -hmm. Five days. At the end of the five days, we're playing a game pool at like five in the morning. And my tattoo artist, this guy actually, who's doing that mural, uh, the Mm -hmm. program I'm opening, he was always there. He would come down. He's from Richmond, Virginia, and he would tattoo us. And he was always just kind of hanging out. Great guy. Shout out to Mitchell. Um, Mitchell Cantor, and this is so wrong that it's right. 5 a.m. shooting a game of pool, been awake for five days on copious amounts of cocaine. <laughs> Bam and I play a game of pool. I win the game of pool. We then proceed to a bedroom. I lay down on the bed. Bam pulls out a, a laptop, puts a porn on, jerks off onto my arm here, <laughs> comes on my arm. Mitchell traces around it, 
with black ink, but then puts a new needle on it and then traces the cum into my arm here. So I actually have Bams come in me without him ever even had fucked me. <laughs> well, maybe the only guy. So Damn, question, what's the, log so the logistics of this? So I used to, I used to get loaded and, and be in bars and to the barkeep. I'm like, yo, if, if you guess what this is, I'll give you a hundred bucks. No one ever guessed until one day we were at Philly airport and I order a glass of wine and there's this flamboyantly gay um, bartender and I'm like, Yo, guess what this is? I'll give you a hundred bucks. And he looks at it, he goes, oh, sweetie, that's cum. <laughs> <laughs> then he licked your arm. <laughs> the fucking glass of wine cost eight bucks and my tip was a hundred. I'm like, I quit that game. That's why I didn't bet you guys. <laughs> You're like, so was America's everyone, weird now. Was everyone naked in this room then or was just Bam naked? No, I, no one was naked. Bam just, well, he, he just fucking jerked, jerked off. off. Just curious. He kept then, his pants so on. So you have to keep your arm like this while he's tattooing? I was like this because he like put a pillow over my head because he like couldn't, it, my looks didn't do it for him apparently. <laughs> you want to stop staring him in the eyes? Yeah, dude, that's, that's <laughs> eye contact's next level. <laughs> Which leads us into this next tattoo, and then we'll keep moving with your fucking game that makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. So two guys fucking doggy style is, is, is gay, right? It's gay. It's some, some would say. But two guys... F okay, so wait. In the skateboarding world, mm -hmm. rollerbladers are considered to be gay, right? Mm -hmm. Like skateboarders and rollerbladers have this rivalry for fucking ever, and, and they're like, they just are, skaters call rollerbladers gay, whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In the gay world, two gay guys fucking doggy style is gay. Mm -hmm. But two guys fucking missionary style staring into each other's eyes is like next level. That's the ultimate gay. It's like Kundalini. S bam. So, <laughs> Halloween. Big party, tattoo artist there. I dress up as the gay biker and I have like these assless and crashless, crotchless chops on, chaps. Um, and I decide that I'm going to get a tattoo of two <laughs> rollerbladers fully padded. You see the dicks. Fucking missionary style. <laughs> in a flower patch as he holds the Yo. flag. His dick's hard as he stares into him. Fucking... That's that's like you know I always thought about contact. getting like a a, <laughs> what are you, a sleeve, but I never know what to get, and now I know. Just get some guys fucking. Dude, <laughs> this, is not, I would, this is not a small tattoo either by any means. Like, the dicks are bigger like, than mine. This is like a six hey, to seven. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> impressive. That is bigger than an index card. And yeah. they're fucking in rollerblades. <laughs> Let us not forget. <laughs> Question two. <laughs> the important part. What is the biggest lie you've ever told your sponsor? Um, that's dude. That's that. That's that's a boring question. Because <laughs> like once I ended up in sobriety and I was just so beaten that like at the end, uh -huh. I was like far past lying. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like I had told way bigger lies to way more important people. Mm -hmm. My sponsor, none, because my they knew what they were dealing with when they got me, mm -hmm. right? So it was never like, you know, in the program, like, we would suggested that you don't get no relationship for a year, right? Like, And I wasn't a guy that came in, like, trying to get women. I wanted no part. I was, like, fucking so disconnected. I just wanted to figure out how to talk again, like, mm -hmm. for real. And, um, and my sponsor's like, dude, I'm not going to tell you not to get no vows with a woman, but, like, here's what happens if you do. You know, because mm -hmm. they kind of knew that, like, I was just weathered and i've been around the block a lot of times and mm -hmm. I, I wasn't gonna be that guy that like okay we need you you know home by six and <laughs> on this phone and prayer study by seven or whatever you know mm -hmm. so there was really like no lies at the end right yeah so so what's the worst thing you ever did for your addiction um well the reality is the worst thing i ever did for my addiction was like um kill my mother on a layaway plan for 22 years that was the worst thing. Like what do you mean by that? The things that I had done in order to continue with my habit, like, slowly killed her every mm. fucking day. So just and that's, like, unacceptable to me. That woman means everything to me in this world. And, and the things that she had to endure because of my addiction is by far the worst thing. Now, you would look back and be like, maybe letting men blow you or maybe, like, <laughs> right. sleeping in abandoned houses. Right. That's a fucking, that's just par for the course. Mm. But the reality is, like, when my mother, on May 25th, the last day, stood on her front porch in Baltimore on the stoop and, 
And I knocked on the door, and she had answered it, and she literally was just crying uncontrollably. And, 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 and at that point, it was like she had bought me a plot. She had already bought me a plot. At that point, she had, she had sold three homes to pay for me to go to two different treatment centers. At that point, she was literally praying to God, please cure him or kill him because I can't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, she, at that point... I couldn't even deny, like, my actions and, and the effect that it had on her. And I wasn't even about to try to talk it back. So all I could do was look at her, and, and I just said to her, like, do you hate me? Do you hate me? And she said, I don't hate you, but I can no longer love you to death. Like You have to go. And that... That by far is the worst thing that I ever done for my addiction, because it didn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. And that woman who is still to this day is, is my number one fan, my biggest supporter. The woman who like prayed for me when I didn't pray for myself. She fed me when I didn't feed myself. She showed up for me when I didn't show up for myself. She loved me when I didn't love myself. She 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 did everything for me. You know that's just. There's no words that can describe how fucking wrong that is. Do you think, do you wish she would have said that to you earlier or do you think it would have fell on deaf ears at an earlier point? It would have fell on deaf ears, you know. It was um, just the right time, right word at the right time. I'm such a believer in alignment, mm -hmm. you know, and, and things have to align. And I had probably heard that a billion times. Mm -hmm. But that day, so many things were in alignment that I listened and it made sense. You know, none of this shit made sense until it made sense. Mm -hmm. And that on that day, a lot of things that were said before that didn't make sense made fucking sense. Mm -hmm. And it was like literally at that moment, like the skies parted. And I walked across the sea and it was, it was so apparently clear and, and easy to see. Not only what the problem was, but what the solution was. And I haven't even entered into that treatment center yet. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like all those seeds that were planted along the way, like fucking bloomed like they had just did a kilo of cocaine <laughs> like fucking <laughs> and uh and and since that day my sobriety um and i'm not saying it's to like fucking put this hex on me but has been fairly easy because i was so beaten and so battered demoralized in just a fashion beaten into that state of reasonableness from drugs and alcohol that like I became a sponge and I absorbed everything that, that a very close core group of people that I believed in instilled in me. And, and I've, 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 I've held that true to myself and my heart since that day. And, and I've continued to do what I did in the beginning to get sober eight years later to stay sober, you know? So did your, I'm just curious with your brother, did he try to help you? I know he, he's a lawyer for the white house, correct? Did he try to help you or was that really hard for him because of his position and his job? No, they all tried to help me in their own right, you mm -hmm. know. But the thing was, by the time people were aware of my situation, I was so far out to see, you know, because prior to that date, I had done these things in life that people would accredit to success, happiness, potentially even dream of doing. And it looked like uh, externally speaking, I was a successful individual. But in reality, I was just a full-blown drug addict and alcoholic who could not maintain day-to-day -day activities. And um, But by the time people caught heed to the reality of what my situation really looked like, I was fucking way out there. So were you ever recognized when you were, you know, in those really bad throes of addiction where you were living on the streets and oh, stuff? Oh, totally. And that, that kind of helped, uh, helped enable my day-to-day activities mm. oh really like people yeah, would like totally cater to you fucking right well, i mean i would love to part like it, there's people like celebrities where i'm like i would love to party with that dude so i can see where that would become a problem i don't know oh because would people like be like oh let's go get a drink or something no, well, it was, I was like far past the let's okay. get a drink. Kind <laughs> okay. of I'm like, I don't know if like they see. I was not like, hey, let's I'm go like, fucking with it. happy hour. <laughs> you insane. I can't, I can't like, no, I mean like if you're like on the street in Baltimore and you were like, oh, can I get like a, like some money or whatever? Someone would be like, oh, like I'll get you something to eat. 
you know yeah, and then yeah, like, i would get that but that that was just whatever but usually like i'd end up in these really precarious situations with these shady people and uh and someone would generally kind of understand or hear about who i was and then just kind of we'd end up teaming up together and go on these insane fucking just expeditions like mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah for like days weeks months you know and my fiance's i was engaged twice and Clearly, they had a pattern of trying to stand between me and drugs, so they always had to go um, because that's just how it was. It was, it was business, right? It's not personal. And, but they would always kind of vet people, um, put trackers on my phone. File, you know, they really tried to do their best they could, but it only lasts for so long. Well, especially because, like, anybody can want something for you. It doesn't fucking matter yeah. if you don't want it for yourself. Yeah, totally. But I, you know, they thank tried God a for, for effort. Them. Yeah. <laughs> and you like know. they play roles like they're little angels for their time, you know? Absolutely. That's why I don't look at any of those attempts as a failure. Um, yes. Because really, and I, I'm guilty of it now, but I, I sometimes uh, more so than not, unfortunately, believe that I understand what someone's process should look like in order to create the best outcome. So all of a sudden now, because I fucking have a little bit of knowledge under my belt, I believe that I'm the great I am, and, and for lack of better words, God, and I can dictate what your outcome is going to look like. But all I'm doing, ultimately, is robbing you of your process. Mm -hmm. And if someone would have robbed me of my process, right, if, if, if someone would have said, you leave him and they go, mm -hmm. and, and, or whatever it looks like, I very well may not be sitting here today with, with what I have and who I am, which mm -hmm. ultimately is a child of God who really gives his all to humanity to make it a better place. Like legit, not fucking word of mouth service bullshit. Like I like I literally live for that. And um and and that was as a direct result of me continually continuously being Failing. divinely inconvenienced. Yeah. Because it's all perspective. Yeah. Right? So I didn't see that at the time. I saw it as why me, why me? If I didn't just get a fucking break, if the judge just would have fucking got laid the night before, right. if the if the PO wasn't a fucking bitch. Yeah. But really, like, that was part of the process that was necessary. Well, and people, like, always look at other people and be like, oh, look, they're successful, or they're successful, or they're successful. People are only able to be an example of success because they kept going through the times that they weren't successful. Absolutely. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, not to be like this, but, like, Colonel Sanders or whatever who made the KFC chicken. I'm just Where saying. the fuck are you going? Listen, <laughs> listen, All right. listen. Follow the belt. Listen. Follow the belting ball. Go ahead. He literally tried to sell his fucking recipe a thousand and ninety eight times. People would have stopped after sure. like the third time, bro. Absolutely. Like he literally tried over a thousand times. Did he get famous? Yes. Did he get his establishment? Yes. Was he a thousand years old? Maybe. That's not the fucking point. <laughs> he didn't stop. Mars <laughs> fucking. He didn't. Mars stories. I I'm She's, just saying. She I'm always comes out of saying. nowhere with them, but they do hit like seventy five percent. I'll give her a seventy five percent hit rate <laughs> with the thing she says. Like it, that works. <gasps> But when she started the sentence, I was like, I don't know where the fuck this is going. Stop, you guys are making me hot. <laughs> I like completely in this whole sexual depraved fucking depiction that I've created in my mind. It's just. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to uh, plead the fifth. We'll go back to sexually depraved. Who is the smallest dick on Jackass? Um, fuck. <laughs> Mine was for like a long time. I got sober, it got bigger, oddly enough. Oh, really? And I was definitely told on many occasions that I'm a grower, not a shower. But now that seems to be different. I guess because I, I take care of my body more and I like manicure and fuck it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm like on point. And <laughs> back in the day, I used on to like point. shave it to add an extra inch or two. You know, you don't trim your pubes anymore. No, I do now. Oh, okay. But I'm saying now, for some reason, in sobriety, he said shave before. He said trim now. Well, oh, I meant the same <laughs> all the way around. Oh, okay. Like, I just like, shave. You don't understand guys' dicks. <laughs> okay. Right? Well, we, we I'm don't, we're speaking the same a language. Shaving could give you an inch, whereas a trimming could give you maybe a half inch. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's called science, she people. Point. She has a point. <laughs> Mara loves the little ones, by the way. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> nah, she doesn't like white guys. Sorry, guys. I hate it here. <laughs> <laughs> Question five. Who is the worst skateboarder you know personally? Oh, man. Fuck, that's a, that's a bad one. Ask me. <laughs> 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 I'm just trying to create enemies out of this. Um... <laughs> Not someone reading Justin for filth. <laughs> I would say like the 
the, the that I know personally. Yeah. Oh fuck. Um. Just like it, this isn't even like a, a great answer, but like my buddy Cleveland, who's in my sober houses now, who like lived with Bam and I for a while over at the house, and just kind of like prided himself on being a skater, but really he was a very um. Uh, unhealthy, not in shape, overweight guy who really didn't take care of himself and just skate it because we skate it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was the guy growing up. Like all, all my friends skateboarded, and I just had a bike, and all I would do is talk shit while they all did cool things, and I was <laughs> I would just be the one that would be really good with quips. So I was the guy that hung around. I would do a film. What was Did that? You say clips. No quips, like I would speak oh, really fast. Like clips. I would, I would be good with like comebacks real fast. Gotcha. They would be skateboarding. I would make fun of them when they would fuck up. Understood. Understood. So I would have the quip. I would, be like, I would have the joke. Well, right either away. that happens or you become a filmer. Yeah. So Oops. yeah. Yeah. But I mean, growing up, we didn't really have cameras like that. We had like really shitty cameras. We we weren't like CKY and stuff. But we <laughs> we did do like jackass type stuff. Like we would light our, ourselves on fire and stuff. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> See, you you definitely inspired me to do some cool things. So, <laughs> so you sp spoke about how you got a lot of injuries. What was the bigger adrenaline rush, the drugs or doing stunts? Well, obviously the stunts because they were much more memorable. And I, I did them around, like, my friends and, and brothers who I loved. Mm -hmm. and created some of the by far best memories of my life. You know, it was a, a healthy outlet, if you will. Right. As opposed to, you know... Um, shooting up in my neck. Is that... I can't imagine putting a needle in. Needle scares me. Yeah. Well, it used to scare me, too. How did you... What was the first time actually putting it in like? Well, the first time how it happened was I... I overdosed at the wheel, and, and my head... I got into an accident, and my head went through the windshield. Mm -hmm. So I ended up in the hospital, and, and I never shot heroin at that point, but they had IVs in. Mm-hmm. And my girlfriend at the time, she came to the hospital. I had all these staples in my head, and I was in a bad way. And, and she called our guy, and my guy brought me heroin. And and he shot it at that point. So he had a, a, a needle and, and the deal, and he cooked it up. But then he just put it into the line that they already had running. Oh, yeah. So it, it hit me. And at that moment, I was – so that was the no very first way. time. And then what happens – and this is a, a, a pretty familiar story in the world of addiction is – to become a heroin addict and stay a heroin addict, it costs some money. And in the beginning, you generally start out with some money in the bank. And, and as time progresses, that money, like, dwindles away. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, I'd sniff, let's say, 80, 100 bucks worth of heroin a day to get really high. And now I wake up and I'm sick, and all of a sudden I only have 10 bucks. And $10 bag of heroin is mm. not going to do what 100 would do. Right. So all of a sudden, I have a buddy, whatever that scenario looks like, who says, yo, just fucking shoot it, and you'll get higher than you would if you sniffed 16 bags or, or you know, whatever. And then usually someone hits you. Like, I'd have to give it to you, and if you're already familiar with how to do it, you you shoot me up, and I have to give you a little bit of dope. But still, mm -hmm. I get, like, crazy high, way higher than I would have if I sniffed those eight bags. Is it the same type of high, but it's just... It's enhanced. It's like yeah, crazy enhanced? Totally. Like so, doing tequila rather than just beer? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. So then, and then all of a sudden, now I'm, I, I, there's somebody that I, I have to go score. And then when I score, I go to your house and I have to throw you a little bit. But then I get tired of doing that. So all of a sudden, I, I you know, I become a bit more willing to, to be a bit more creative and, and learn how that works. Mm. You know? Everything is learnable. It is. <laughs> this is a weird ad. <laughs> the more you know. It is. So, it's true. Do you have any like ill feelings towards your girlfriend at that time? No, I love them all to death, man. Before, is now, and after. Because I was always the problem in all the situations. They were always really good women. Um, and a common theme in my story at that time was I would drink, I would drug, I would disappear for days, weeks, and I would cheat. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's just fucking not right to someone who's, like, really a good person who's doing their best to help you. And, and, and they did. They really did. So I'd leave me, too. Fuck. I mean, did they ever, like, do drugs with you to try to be more a part of your life? One did. No, but she didn't. But she was going to. She attempted to sniff some heroin, and I, like, lost it. And she's like, I just need to understand the importance of this and why you continuously choose this over me, who's 
literally trying to give you the world. And I understood that. But I also Damn, understood like what crazy. she was. Think about it. That is crazy. Think I, about it. you have a man you love and you'll do anything for and you fucking give him everything plus. And he just will not leave this fucking substance alone. That I, is crazy. I mean, I understand. To do the, heroin, like, that's to a big jump. understand, like, that's crazy. But you'll never understand until you understand. It, right. You know what no, I mean? no, it's like, be- I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's fucked up, but it no, is yeah. beautiful at the same time. But, like, that's, like, love is just a crazy thing. Like, I understand because, so, oh. say, me and my girl, she, like, she used to, like, to drink one night during the week. And I never actually wanted to drink. But I would do it because I loved her and I wanted to spend time with her. So, I understand to a certain degree, not you know, the harder drugs, but I didn't really feel like drinking, but I was like, I want to spend time same with her. Same thing though, even yeah, though it's, it's just, it's, it's a similar alcohol over heroin, same exact scenario, mm-hmm. just well, different substance. What's the difference? Like this, does your vision change when you're on drugs? Like I've never done any drugs. Is there a difference between drunk and like fucked up on heroin? Yeah. Yeah. Clearly. Like, you know, like, okay. So when I, was I don't like, know what it looks when like. When I was, you know, when, when either, Bab honestly. had brought me from Baltimore to Pennsylvania and I got an entrance and, you know, introduced to this whole world and them not understanding addiction, it was totally okay and sociably acceptable for me to drink and do cocaine. Completely okay right. with everybody involved. Professionally, right. personal, intimately. It was good. But what I was not allowed to do was um, opiates of any form, whether it was through a pill or a heroin. And everyone was widely fucking you know, informed of that um, because... If the moment I start doing that, I start falling asleep in mid conversation. I, I then start stealing your wallet and stealing your car and disappearing for days. You know what I mean? They, they just didn't understand that, rightfully so. So cocaine you wouldn't steal, but heroin you would steal. Yeah, because like coke is just a party thing. It's fun, but my body does not become physically addicted to it. Meaning mm. I don't need it. Right, right, right. Give me an opiate for roughly three to definitely seven days in a row. Mm. Take it away. My my body has built up a physical dependency for it. Mm-hmm. You know that's why I think doctors are like, and I'm not lumping all doctors in with this statement, but the major, a lot of doctors. Are, are, are worse than the drug dealers on the corner selling heroin. So what are like uh, clinics, like addiction clinics doing wrong when it comes to that? You're talking about the doctors. Are the doctors the problem where they don't really care? Or? There's a lot. I mean, what do you mean by addiction clinics? Or you mean rehabs? rehabs, yeah. So rehabs. What is a, what's rehab doing wrong to keep? Well, I don't, I don't have the answer to that, right? Because if I did, I would bottle that thing up. I'd sell it and I'd be a billionaire a billion times over. Mm-hmm. Like we would not be in the epidemic that we're at today with the opioid crisis. Right. No one has the answer to that. Um, and the reality is that's what adds to the complexity of, of alcoholism and addiction is that it's not a black and white one size fits all that comes with an instruction manual, mm-hmm. right? To your girlfriend, what works for her to keep her sober may not very well work for me. Right. So you kind of have to meet people where they're at and, and not where you believe they should be or the direction you think they're headed in. Right. And, 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 and <laughs> I'm, like I'm of the notion of... Um, because it's my experience, it's my narrative, I'm married to it because it worked for me, is that you can get sober in a fucking crack house, like straight up, if you're ready. So, but then to your girl, she might be like, that's insane, I could never get sober sitting on a barroom stool, mm-hmm. um, and rightfully so. So that that's what adds to like the layers of this. I believe the perfect treatment is center is the one you get sober in. The one that I went to cost me $2 to get into. Legit, $2. I was going to say, you Bottom can't be barrel. like, oh, the the rehabs are fucking up here because it, it really comes down to like what he said. Like, you're going to rehab until you're either dead or you're working your program. Mm-hmm. Really. I've, or been you're, in, I've been in like the, the, the five-star aromatherapy private chef facilities in the beginning. And as my alcoholism progressed, so did my treatment center stays. And at the end, I ended up walking into my 13th facility um, with eight scarves, two jackets, three socks, needle spoon restraining order, and it literally cost me $2 to get into. Was that restraining order with one of your previous relationships? My mother. She had that served on me at that day, standing on that stoop. Mm. All of a sudden, she handed me, my, my brother handed me my worldly belongings. And with that, a police officer pulled around the corner and he walked up. He said, are you Mr. Novak? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, uh, this is for you. In front of your mom? Right there. And he said, I promise you, if I catch you back on your mother's premises, I will not be so kind. 
take heed. That's crazy. And 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 uh, yeah, yeah. So, so like, what did it like? How long did she take to like open herself to you again? Well, she never not opened herself up to me. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, when I was served with that restraining order, my brother stayed at the house with her for the next five days because he knew that she if was... he left, she would let me back in. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. kind of love that she has for me. And right. So, um, but a juxtaposition, a light at the end of this rather dark fucking drab story that I'm sharing with you. Eight months into my process of sobriety, that woman, my mother, called me. And I'm now living in a sober living house in Levittown, Pennsylvania. And she said, Brandon, I hate when you come to visit me. And I said, why? Because I've been doing all this work on myself. And she said, because I get so sad when you leave. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, but I didn't go around much. And what I did differently was I didn't end up in treatment. And I didn't start writing these fucking beautiful romantic letters, um, with these really intelligent, articulate words to make you think that I was this insanely smart guy. I, as a matter of fact, I kind of cut off most of my communication with people because I knew that my words held no more weight. And mm -hmm. for the first time in my life, I decided that I was going to let my walk do my talk. My behavior started to change. All of a sudden, I wasn't calling my mother saying how great my life is and how much better it's going to be. I wasn't calling my team and saying, all right, this is what we have. Let's get this going. Let's get this. Like, literally radio silence. And everyone's like, whoa. And then my get well job was, I, I was washing dishes in a diner, uh, in Marianne's diner, it, for $6 an hour under the table next to a 14-year-old kid named Brian. And then what happened was I, I started to become self-sufficient. I started, like, um, paying my own sober living house bill, which was $165 a week. I started, I was paying weekly. Then I started paying bi-weekly, and I opened up my own uh, savings account. I, I, I got my own ATM card, because I could always get money. I just couldn't keep money. So I'd have, like, a really good woman in my life, and I would give the money, and they'd make the house a home, and they'd continue to keep things afloat. I'd never been self-sufficient. And looking back, that's why I always had a woman in my life. Right? It was never because like I'm a fucking egotistical fucking guy who needs to show you how much of a man I am. It was really because like God forbid I had to be with me and look at me. Mm -hmm. So like I always kept a woman in my life and really for necessity. But then for the first time in my life, I started like becoming self-sufficient. I, I had acquired this job. I showed up every day. I, I came 20 minutes early. I stayed 20 minutes late. Opened up my own account. Started paying my own way. Catching the bus to and from and and what happened is I had completely no self-esteem I lacked self-esteem by any and all means and I didn't know how to find it myself or else I would have but but what happened is through through it's, it's so crazy and this all kind of happens unbeknownst to me but by by showing up and just doing what was required of me um Unbeknownst to me, I, I had gained the self-esteem through doing these esteemable acts, right? Because you're keeping your word with yourself. Yeah. So all of a sudden, through doing these esteemable acts, by, by meaning what I say, saying what I mean, showing up, being accountable for my actions, unbeknownst to me, one day I was able to like look my head up a little higher and, and stare at you and talk to you with conviction and not worry about what your perception of me would be. And I started paying my own rent and... And, I, and, you know, that, that kind of plays into or it could be looked at as to why, you know, in coming up on eight years, I've only been in like three relationships. It could be that because I've learned to like myself and love myself and really like to be with me. Or it could be that I'm just not willing to address the fucking issues that I deal with mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to do what it takes to stay in a relationship. So do you think you could be in a relationship now that you're sober or do you think it's just not the right time? I think I could. Oh, I, I could. I could fucking be a uh, a brain surgeon if I want. Like I legit believe in my mind. I can do anything I want. Mars year. gonna <laughs> look. Mars look. Man spreading. There she goes. I told <laughs> you. She just, just fucking, fucking put it on my dick out right at all times. <laughs> you see that shit? <laughs> I'm just like oh, seriously though. Period. Jesus. Because anyone could. It's just like making the decisions and showing up for yourself literally every day, mm -hmm. and it's not easy or no. comfortable. No, but fuck no. It's just, it's like that you decided and that's just what it is now. 
Well, I've learned this all along the way is that mentality will create reality. Yeah. Right. And, and and the majority of the things I do, it's like fuck motivation. Who fucking cares about motivation? Motivation isn't even real. And, and every day that I wake up, I, I now do an ice bath every morning. I do two minutes in an ice bath. And every day I fucking dread it like I'm going to the dentist. I mm-hmm. want no part of the ice bath. And do I ever have motivation to do it? Absolutely not. But through discipline actually following through with my actions, showing up and fucking doing it after i get out i then find the motivation to say to myself i'll keep this going you know what i mean so it's really motivation that's bred from discipline i don't ever want to do the majority of the shit that i'm doing for the most part when that it's was gonna active. be my mar moment today what when you asked me that earlier like i was like thinking about Okay, I'm like, what would my mar moment be today? And it would be like, there are a lot. People will be like, oh, how do you, how do you know that? Or where did you hear that? Or da 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 da. And it's like I make myself listen to a book every day for at least an hour. I don't mm-hmm. want to. I'd rather fucking listen to music or take a fucking nap. But like, I don't want to. I just do. Do something that sucks every day. Yeah. Well, and it's like it sucks. But like he said, his sobriety has been easy. So he does a bunch of shit that sucks, but it feels easy to him because it it's putting him in a position to be who he believes he is. Yeah, so that... And, and in the beginning, putting myself in those really uncomfortable, undesirable positions is is so abnormal, right? But now, after having done it long enough for a continuous period of time, it has become the normal. So it's for me to nature. wake up tomorrow... For me to wake up... To, for me to not wake up tomorrow morning at 5 a.m., be in the gym at 6, and in an ice bath by 7 is abnormal, right? You just complete role reversal. Yeah, you know your recipe. Yeah, like if I chose to sleep in tomorrow till 7, that would become the abnormal. Right. So it's literally, so here, how it all happened was I had a spiritual experience. The definition of a spiritual experience is a psychic change, mm-hmm. meaning that I, as a direct result of the spiritual experience, have been completely rewired. I no longer think, look at, or react to things the way that I did prior to sobriety. You know, I'm a completely fucking different man. Yeah, your self-concept is different. Yes. My, my morals, my standards, my behavior. What you said earlier, exactly. Your mood, your attitude. Yeah. You're helping people other than yourself now with like the Novak house. Yeah, I love that. Um, because what these fucking nut job caught people told me in the beginning, those 12 step sober people, right? Because in the beginning, I wasn't buying what they were selling. I was not drinking the Kool Aid. I believed nothing they said. I wanted no part of them. And even when I ended up in those programs, you know, this time, I still didn't want to be there in the beginning. I just had nowhere else to go. Mm-hmm. And no one else was welcoming me to their fucking table, party, mm-hmm. or event. Rightfully so. But I get here, I buy into the concept, and um, what they told me was like, remember I told you I took heed to everything they said? Because I wasn't scared to like use and die, right? That was just a, of course that's what fucking happens. And to me at that point, to use and die was kind of like a welcoming thought, because then at least it's over. my mother could like finally be at peace, mm-hmm. knowing that like I'm safe once and for all, mm-hmm. right? And I really wanted that. And no matter how that looked, I wanted my mother to just have peace of mind, Um but to me, what scared me into sobriety and, and reality was like, if I were to go back and drink or shoot dope, to not death, but to like actually live. And then I have to wake up tomorrow to do things that I do not want to fucking do to, to continue to enable my addiction. So again, I absorbed everything that they said like a sponge. And one of the things they told me that in order for me to keep what I have, I have to give it away. So I, I was in treatment for 90 days, and from that 90-day facility, I went to that sober living house where I lived for a year. And that sober living house really did for me what no other person, place, or thing had ever been able to do. And um, I vowed to myself that when I found myself in a position where I was financially capable, I was going to recreate mm-hmm. that house. Cut to five years later, I'm in that position. I recreate that house, and I open my very first Novak's house in Wilmington, Delaware. One house with 10 beds. That was two years and eight months ago. Today, I have six houses with 65 beds. Damn. And 
one of my missions and the why behind my cause is that I refuse to let money be a deterrent as to why someone can't find safe, adequate, sober houses to live in after completing treatment. So I raise and get generous donations from wealthy people all around a lot of capital to provide a scholarship fund. So I literally... If I have a bed available and there's a man, because I only have men's beds, there's a man that wants sober living, I can help you with no money. And that's my deal. So from that, that has also transcended into me opening my own treatment center that will be opened April 1st called um, Redemption. Redemption Addiction Treatment Center. And wait, where is that going to be? That will be in Delaware as well. And... uh that was always my end game. That was always my dream. Uh, but I really didn't believe that I was capable of producing it. And, and things have aligned. And, and now my dream is becoming a reality, as a lot of other ones have along my journey with sobriety. Hence me. I walked into fucking sobriety almost eight years ago with eight scarves, two jackets, three socks, a stick of deodorant, a needle, a spoon, and a restraining order. 38-year-old homeless heroin addict who went to kill himself on a daily basis. I just was terrified of hurting myself in the process to today having the ability to take what was once killing me one bag at a time to turning that into such a valuable asset that allows me to help hundreds of thousands of people, literally. Um, and if that's not a blessing, I don't fucking know what is. Um, so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be in the position that I'm in. Yeah, and the sick. beautiful thing about it is, is, is that it's nothing that I've done, mm -hmm. right? All You're that like I did, all that I did was I just showed up May 25th in a position that had never been so bad in my life and admitted complete defeat. And the day that I admitted complete defeat, I secured the ultimate victory. Unbeknownst to me, <laughs> I had no <laughs> idea these blessings that were taking place. I was incapable of seeing them because all I could see was the mess because things were so fucking bad. But I showed up, I showed up, I showed up. I didn't believe in me, but I believed in the people around me. So through believing in them, I ended up believing in me. And, and what I know to be true today is that um, the disease of addiction is not a death sentence, right? Um, but the reality is, if you look at the statistics, if you look at the cold, hard data and numbers, it looks like we're fighting a very unwinning battle. It's very undesirable. It's very unattractive. It's so unappealing. Most people think that recovery is not possible, and, and nine times out of ten, you will die with a needle in your arm or a, a bottle in your mouth. So what I do is use my platform that I've been blessed with prior to sobriety when I was a complete insane man um, to now use as a, an avenue to, to deliver my message in a form of attraction rather than promotion in, in such a way that I hope people find it so desirable, so appealing, so attractive, so much so that they like want to fuck it. <laughs> right because if yes. i can get somebody to the point that they want what i have so bad that they're willing to do whatever it takes just like i was may 25th 2015 guess what the terms of their contract will forever change but it has to become our idea right you said it earlier mm -hmm. you, you can't. it doesn't matter yeah so it's uh you know and this is nothing that I've learned. <laughs> this is not, so I always say this thing works when I don't work it. When I stay out of my way and completely like give my life over to my creator and have a very personal connection with my higher power, my maker, my life goes really, really well. That's awesome. So we have some people that actually were are in Novak's house or were in Novak's house and just wanted to <laughs> say something. Oh, it was a minute and 11 What's up, seconds. Brandon and the cast, how we doing? Um, my name is Ryan. I go by Hoodie here in the houses. Um, you know, I just wanted to reach out and say thank you for everything you've done. Um, it's been quite a process living here. Uh, came in pretty much with nothing in my name. Um, and there were some suggestions I had to take to, uh, kind of formulate this journey that I'm going through. Um, and just by doing that and, and, and continuously working, um, my life has transformed. I came in pretty much broke living hotel to hotel. Uh, I was definitely um, 
out in places I shouldn't have been and uh, coming around a brotherhood like this, um, a guidance of Brandon and the people in the houses has really, uh, it's really captivated how my life is going. I uh, now have what I consider a decently successful career. Um, I manage one of the houses here. I try to give back as much as possible and that's all due to Brandon, um, Greek and the guys in the houses. So uh, this is just my thank you. That's my guy. He's now he's now a general manager at Hooters, and, and he gets <laughs> guys in my house employed at Hooters and at the facility that I'm opening. And I have a whole bunch of contractors and they're doing work. And lo and behold, the other day, the fucking like four girls show up, full on Hooters outfit -uh. to a, a house full of dudes. <laughs> wow, like, like, like a, a commercial building of construction workers, uh -huh. and just start giving wings and Fire. posters. <laughs> And then, and then, right, any press is good press. Here you go to prove a point. And then, of course, I take a picture with the Hooters girls in front of the facility. And then uh, they post it on their stuff, and I put it on my story. And cut to my business partner, who's in Massachusetts, who thinks it's amazing. And he was my mentor since day one. He's like, yeah, that picture ended up in, like, one of the moms groups of Massachusetts. And they're talking about how you're demoralizing women. And, and that's so <laughs> not nice. It's their shit. fucking job, I Hooters. I didn't yeah, like, they chose this. that. <laughs> like, they know what <laughs> they we're, we know what we're doing. Tactic. Yeah, like. But, so it's, like, in that world. You know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah, I know. <laughs> See, Trust full me. full circle. Comes, <laughs> but Hoodie's my guy, man. I love Hoodie. So, yeah, one more. Why does it keep going like that? Where does it keep They look going? like aliens when they're smushed like this. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> VLC is being weird. But. No. Why are you doing this weird? But anyway. October of 2020. Oh, wow. Eddie. This is Eddie. The facility he shared a story. He also shared that he was opening a sober living facility in Wilmington, Delaware, which, oddly enough, that's where I'm from. And even more conveniently, I had no idea what I was going to do after that last go round. So I said, sign me up. I get discharged, I move in, it's just me and the house manager there. He was our first there client. began the Your first guy journey ever? that really first guy, first set the direction of where my life is today. Um, that initial structure that was offered there, the relationships that I built with the guys, Brandon, Greek, you know, the opportunities that I came across to not only better my life, but help others along in the process, you know, all that growth just it really speaks volumes to what we in the recovery community are really capable of when we, you know, stick together and stick to a purpose that is of a higher meaning, whatever that is to you. And, uh, you know, what I have today, I, I, I have a, you know, I have a career, I own a home, I have a relationship that I rebuilt, I have puppies that depend on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's just, you know, life is beautiful today and I'm, I'm glad that I can experience it and I definitely owe something big to you know, Brandon and what he's doing. He's doing something great. Um, I could wish him all the best and it's all love. Thank you. Yeah, and that that's like the the why. You mm -hmm. know. The, the the he did not come on a scholarship, but the other one did come on a scholarship. And nine out of ten of the men that come through those doors have no money and we provide them these scholarships and we literally will set them up for success. Because I understand what it's like to be in that position, you mm -hmm. know, where you know, you're the undesirable. You're you're the the have not, and and my goal is to make the undesirables become desirable, you know, the unattractive to become attractive, the the defects turned into the assets, and, mm -hmm. and those guys are that that guy moved out with the first house manager, and they bought their own house, man. And that's he awesome. Had like a career making six figures, and and that's the other one is the other guy is a house manager who now employs other guys who just moved into the house that don't have you know what i mean mm -hmm. and that's that's how we i believe we create change i don't have the fucking answer i don't know what to tell you <laughs> that will fix this situation i really don't but what i do know is that someone helped me i in turn helped another two people then help two more that's two to four four to eight eight to 16 before you know it we're creating such a movement that mm -hmm. the world's starting to change and the impact is felt right because what i can tell you now is between those one me and those two guys, us three being sober tonight, what that means is um, there will be one less needle found on a playground. There will be one less mother making arrangements for their son to be buried. There will be one less angry probation officer because like they have to spend their time at home away from their kids 
filling out paperwork to violate us. Right. You know what I mean? Like the, the snowball effect is so fucking deep and it goes so far. It's really profound that you are able to actually realize all the people that you affect when you do do just shooting up, just being, yeah. being an addict. There's so many people that you affect and then not being an addict and helping others has an even more profound effect. Yeah, it goes so far and so yeah. fast. And and that's why, because here's the deal, man. Anywhere in the world of any form of business, if I am to give you some of what I have, I am absolutely to walk away with less. But in this world of ours, sobriety, if, if we give you some of what we have, we walk away with more. Mm -hmm. It literally defies logic. It's a very magical thing that only takes place in this uh, secret, not so secret world of ours. So you spoke a lot about, they spoke about a brotherhood. You spoke a lot about your mother and mothers. Is there warning signs that family members can see to know that their son or their daughter is starting to become addicted to, drug, to drugs or starting to have a problem with drinking? I mean, it's all behavioral. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, like, I believe if... So, the guys that live in my house, we piss them, right? We give them random analysis, but it's really not that necessary because what happens is we've observed them long enough to understand what their behavioral pattern looks like. So, all of a sudden, when they were very, like, forthcoming and open and, and you know, energetic and, and, and social to now, like coming home right after work and rushing to their bedroom for three days in a row, like that's off, mm -hmm. you know, and we need to address the behavioral patterns. Okay. So I, same goes to be said to a family member, whether it's a husband, a wife, a son, a daughter, just look at the behavioral patterns. When that changes. So what should they do to help that person when they do notice that? I think it's, um, it's best. My approach is to, to not talk to them or at them, but with them. And a lot of times, not say much, but just listen. Because ultimately what will happen is that if you listen long enough, <laughs> the individual will say just enough to incriminate themselves. And then you can just basically use that against them, mm -hmm. right? It's not like, fuck you, you don't know. Well, the reason why I know what I'm saying is because you just fucking told me. <laughs> right, right. Literally. You know yeah, I mean? it's yes. Like, it's just a, um, uh, it's a, it's a sleight of hand card trick kind of game. Mm-hmm. Watch the left while the right does the deal. Um, but you just kind of, just the behaviorals and just meet them where they're at. I feel like you, it's like a knowing too. Like, you know, mm -hmm. especially well, if you have like a close like relationship with someone. But maybe you, you don't know. necessarily know what it is because he was talking about how Bam didn't understand what that was. So there are people that are ignorant to the fact that. Sure. They just don't know the, it exists. The signs. Yet. Maybe yeah. he just thinks he's going through like a teenager thing or. They're going through a weird phase in their life, so I don't know. And that could very well be the case, but uh, I think everything kind of begins with a conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and right now, in this day and age, that rarely happens because we're so consumed with the phone. Mm -hmm. You know, I see that at restaurants and people at a table that rarely interact because they're fucking... On the phone. Yeah, and, you know, it is what it is. So if there was someone out there that is currently addicted, what would you want to say to them? That I've seen a lot of people with a lot of resources, with a lot of money, a lot of property, a lot of prestige, go up against this thing called addiction and alcoholism, and they get beat to fuck every time, right? Like, I've never seen anyone win against this and come out unscathed. And, and anyone that I've met in sobriety or recovery has never left, returned to partying, and then come back to tell me, how awesome it was. And they don't mm. want to get so, they just want to stop in and check in with me and be like, dude, it's <laughs> fucking great smoking meth. You have the yeah. best decision ever made to go back. <laughs> That's so fun. Like, you know, and, and when people come back, it's not because we chase them, right? They come back of their own volition mm -hmm. and we're just here to, to be there for them when they come. The opposite of addiction is connection. It is impossible for you to you. It is impossible for you to use the very same brain that thought you into that position that has become a problem to then think yourself out of. It, it's it's not logical. Um, so what I suggest is that you reach out and you ask for help. You absolutely cannot do this on your own if you're in that position, you know. And at the very least, if you reach out and ask for help, you can then understand the resources that are available for you when that day comes because it's not like it's if it's going to come it's just when mm -hmm. you know so i don't chase people down people call me like yeah but i'm not ready i'm like okay well cool 
uh, my number will be the same and and god willing you'll call me back when you become ready or before it's too late because the issue always gets addressed every time it gets addressed and it gets addressed one of two ways either you choose to address the issue follow through with the suggestions and seek some sort of professional help or the issue addresses you and I get a call from Bobby's mother mm -hmm. saying thanks for trying to help Bobby but he didn't make it mm -hmm. but one out of the two ways the issue is going to be addressed mm -hmm. here's the facts fact of the matter I'm going to break it down if you've been diagnosed as an addict or an alcoholic and this is 100% fact look it up on any fucking outlet you want to look if you've been diagnosed as an addict or an alcoholic all that means is that you've been diagnosed with a disease that if left untreated equals death. It's a fatal disease. That is an absolute fact. But the, the, the severity of the situation is this. See, diagnosis as an addict or an alcoholic, what that means to me is I'm diagnosed with this alcoholic brain that lies to me in my own voice that makes me believe the unbelievable. Right, so it's not like your voice or your voice shows up in my head and is like, "Oh, no, like you can have a glass of wine." I'm like, "Fuck you, stranger danger." It's <laughs> it's, it's my voice in my own brain yeah, that like, makes me believe the unbelievable. It's okay, but to take it a step further, right? I've been diagnosed as an addict and an alcoholic, and I've accepted that diagnosis, no question asked. But as far as I'm aware of, it's the only fatal disease that lies to me in my own voice, making me believe the unbelievable, telling me that I do not have that disease. Follow me. Diagnose me with HIV. I'm rushing to the hospital to get medication. I don't want to die. Fatal disease. Diagnose me with cancer. I'm rushing to the hospital to get chemo. I don't want to die. Fatal disease. Diagnose me as an addict or an alcoholic. I need a glass of wine or a bag of heroin to figure out what the fuck's wrong with you for diagnosing me with said disease. It's just as fatal as the first two diseases. And it's the only disease that you can be blamed for having. Yeah. It's the only one where people say... It's your fault that you're doing heroin or you're an addict. It's the only left to my own devices. I'll believe that I don't have that disease today. Mm -hmm. And I will get up from this chair. I will go to my truck and I will drive to a TD bank machine and I will pull out an undisclosed amount of cash. And, <laughs> and I've been able to save a lot because I haven't fucking right. you're partook busy. in a drink or a drug <laughs> for yeah. a long time. <laughs> you're investing and, elsewhere. And I'll drive right around the way and cop a whole bunch of dope and coke and I can make those actions right now at almost eight years sober make complete sense to me. Complete sense. Mm -hmm. And most people say, what the fuck? The reality is the further I am from the last drink that I took, the more susceptible I am to taking that drink. Mm -hmm. Right? At 90 days, I remember what that pain feels like. And I'm like, dude, I want no part. Eight years later, a man who's uh, you know, a pretty accomplished guy, owns multiple properties, owns his own treatment center, fucking financially successful, goes to bed at nine o'clock, ice baths at six. You know what I mean? Like my life looks, today my brain will tell me armed with the proper facts, understanding what I'm up against it. Well, I could probably have a glass of wine. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like. And Just I, one. I could believe that because my life looks entirely different today. So when people are like, well, what, what, what idiotic behaviors would allow you to believe that like you could do that or you to get up from this table and go, get high and it's very easy and it, and it comes down to that at that point that Brandon would only be attending Brandon's Anonymous Brandon is only sponsoring Brandon and Brandon is Brandon's God mm -hmm. and when those three things are connected it's not a matter of if but when I believe that the most sensible decision to make is to get up from here and get in my truck and go shoot a speedball I've seen me do it <laughs> I've, I've watched myself do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know what it looks like. So this is like, and this isn't even giving like educated guess or hypothesis of what may take place. It's my fucking story in my life. Like it's very easy for me. You know, I was the guy that was deemed unhelpable and unfixable, which I believe today, again, adds to the credibility for, that I possess by having overcome my adversity and turning it into my advantage. Well, and it's like you just... You, it doesn't really even matter what people say to you, like, about you now. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, well, he did this or he did that or he should be X, Y, or Z or here or there. It's like, okay, well, it doesn't matter really what anyone else is saying about you or to you. It doesn't, it's not even my business. Yeah, exactly, because it's just like you're consumed with your shit. Well, and also what I've learned in my program is that um, resentments are addicts and alcoholics' number one offender. And, and it, they will take us back out to a drink or a drug. 
So what I've learned is that an expectation that I place on you is nothing but an unfulfilled resentment, right? Because you will never live up to, to my standards. No one ever will. So it's not a matter of if you're going to let me down, but when. Mm -hmm. So now I've expected you to act a certain way, do a certain thing, say, and now I've left myself in a position where I'm fucking aggravated, agitated, and I have this big resentment. So understanding that, what I know that I control in this world is nothing except for my thinking, my attitude, my behavior. Your How reactions. do I react to your yes, reaction? Yes. Right? Yep. So, and, and knowing that, it makes my life a really, really easy and light to navigate through. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to sit here and fucking call me names for an hour straight and spit in my face, right? Like, it, that is exactly what it is. And, and ultimately, it has nothing to do with you. Everything comes back to self. Yeah. Right? So I have to ask myself why in in God's name, would I sit here for an hour and subject myself to allow you to do that to me? A thousand right? And then it goes even deeper than that, that like, obviously, you are a sick individual such as myself, just like everyone in this room is, and you're suffering with something that I'm not aware of. Yeah, it's like, it's, 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 it's a hands. much deeper yeah. seated issue than you just fucking cussing me out for an hour, spitting in my face continuously. It's, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's, understanding that is like a really beautiful thing. There's like a lot, like, your reaction to shit or like, rem like removing myself when people irritate me, I will literally just disappear from the space. Or like, if I'm just like, I already know that nothing good is going to come in this. So I'm not even going to leave myself space to react. I will just remove myself. So now I rarely find myself in that position because I, I you don't I even go around a this. really different circle of people. Yeah. Mm hmm. It's, and it's so and on a rare chance that I find myself in that position. It's so, strange to me mm -hmm. and i'm an empath and i take on people's energy so I, i'm very easily drained when i find myself in those positions and i was like fuck <laughs> yeah god bless you so you know what does protecting your sobriety look like to you in those kind of situations well it's a lot of things but today where i'm at with my life is i'm on this like crazy spiritual journey and then everything revolves around my connection with my higher power and that word can be very uncomfortable and unattractive to a lot of people. And I get that. I don't know what my higher power is or is not. I just know that it's not me. and It's a power greater than me. So I keep that connection very fucking transparent and authentic and, and, and active on a mm. daily basis. Because I know that today I suffer with a disease called alcoholism, not alcoholism. Mm. And I cannot stay sober on yesterday's sobriety. My sobriety has a shelf life of 24 hours. So I do a few simple things along the way each day to maintain my sobriety. Like I said earlier, I still do today what I did sitting in treatment center number 13 with 90 days sober. Congratulations again, babe, on 90 days sober. That's a big fucking deal, man. <laughs> it's that's, fucking that's, huge. I'm so proud of her. That she, is, that's, she's uh, been killing it. Statistic state theoretical evidence dictates that you and I are to be high or dead right now. The fact that we're not is, is miraculous, equaling a miracle, and B, it defies logic. But we've been blessed with this gift that I know plenty of people that have gave their life for, you know? So it's, it's, it's a big, big deal. Absolutely. So rounding out the episode, Mar, do you want to do the uh, ad read? Oh, sure. Did you send it to me? I sent it to you. Oh, okay, hold on. <laughs> I haven't been... Checking my phone, you know. Thank you, Mar is very uh, a phone girl. As we we speaking about addiction, <laughs> thank you it's, so much. It's for not easy to get her. Mar. She's not <laughs> easy to get her attention with. Her hair's not even pink today. Ooh, it is. A little <laughs> it's bit. not easy to get her attention, but other things you get. <laughs> so do you wash your hair now more because your no, hair's not I pink? Wish. So have you been washing um, your hair? Um, sure. No, she has. She doesn't wash her hair. No, She's, I do. I do. I just. Don't sometimes. <laughs> okay, hold on. <laughs> Which she gets her hair washed once a week when she well, turns Well, when I have my extensions in, Justin, it's science. It's we don't disgusting. have time to go over the science of Okay, just read the app. Hair, so. <laughs> right now. Hold on. What, you're saying That's I don't it? understand hair? Wait, this one's smaller? Yep. Well, no, you were saying you don't understand hair, which actually makes sense because you're hairless. So, um, okay. So hair this, shamer. Oh, Jesus Christ. Mar, you got this. It's the Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what it is, but I, I'm having an issue. <laughs> um, this episode was brought to you by Erotic Boudoir. 
Erotic boudoir are professionals in the adult industry with expertise in sensual pleasure. Allow them to guide you and your partners to a world of ecstasy with their products, events, and techniques catered to your desires. Prioritize your pleasures with Erotic Boudoir. Go to E-R-O-T-I-C-B-O-U-D-O-I-R or touchingbodymindandsoul.com. And use Love and Them What for your next promo code for for 10% off your order of $25 or more. Sorry. Had to throw that out there. Touching Body, Mind, and Soul. That's a pretty lit URL to have. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. I'm not going to lie. We got Love and Them What, so that's pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) So, Amor, is there anything you would like to promote? Just Fairy Garden, and that's it right now. That's all I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, sir, is there anything you would like to promote? So, um, the Wi-Fi is shit, but I think the March 7th, my audiobook? most recent book, The Streets of Baltimore, is uh, coming out on audio version on all major platforms, but I did the narration. So I'm I've been really, waiting for that. really proud of this. Um that and uh, my treatment center that I'm opening April 1st. The Sober House is in Wilmington, Delaware, Novak's House, novaksrecoveryhouse.com if you look it up. Um, but really, most importantly, if, if you're out there and, and you're trying to figure out a way, if you're trying to figure a way out of the position that you found yourself in um, as a direct result of drugs and alcohol, call me. Directly at 610-314-6747. And, and, and me and my team will do the very best that we can to get you the help that you, that you deserve. Does that come right through to that phone? My other phone. Oh, okay. It oh, okay. will <laughs> stop ringing. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would be... So well, that's amazing. Here, it just would, it would just be nonstop. process. <laughs> well, I want to thank Marg for coming out. So check out Fairy Garden. Novak, obviously, this is a huge deal. In the beginning, I said you made me proud to be a fan now, and I still stand by that statement, even more so. All the things I've learned from you and all the things you've taught people here and obviously the people you've helped in your house, it's fucking it's huge. It's enormous. And I, I'm i just happy to call myself a fan of you. Hey, man, I can't wait to I see you progress. That. that means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, no doubt. Wait, so do you like no Joe Dispenza? Oh, yeah. He's a I feel like you would be like him. I'm trying to take a picture for a thumbnail. Mark, you need your phone. You got a good phone.